Tom Gilbert. He is with Deutsche Bank, and he stopped by to talk about the amazing innovation that they are doing and how they're using open source to lower the risk for business. open source software for a long time has been frowned upon or has been kind of hidden in the shadows. We're starting to see that come to light. There's been this idea that if it's free, it must suck, yeah. right? And today what we're finding is the exact opposite is true, is that free and open source software has some of the highest quality and highest security off there. Uh, how has that changed in the industry? Yeah, I d I, I've, I've been really interested in this journey from the beginning, really. My, um, I wouldn't be where I, I was today without the, the Red Hat CD I sent off for in a magazine <laughs> back in the 90s, right? Uh, which really got me into open source. But <clears throat> I think we have a lot uh, to thank for the real juggernauts of open source, like, you know, the Apaches, the Linux, you know, the, these, these projects which just you know, the internet runs on these days. And, and, and I think that that has done a lot to challenge this perception that free software is somehow inferior to, to commercial software. Because uh, I, I, even, even back in, in, in the late 90s, you, you know, the, the internet was running on software like Apache. Um, I joined Deutsche Bank to bring Apache into the bank as an open source. Really? Yeah, to run our web platform. And yeah, sure, it was, there were some challenges then getting that message across that this was the way to do it. But I, I actually think in the engineering community, you, you, there weren't many better choices, right? Um, and so we have a lot to thank for those kind of juggernauts and, and it's snowballed. I mean, now there's this rich ecosystem that is out there that you can, you can do almost, almost anything. You can solve almost any problem. You have so many options and they're available and they're of quality and they're now getting easier and easier to use. So I think, uh, you, you know, the, the momentum is, is, is just been running away. Uh, and we're now in a position where I, I actually think that open source is becoming the default. It's actually starting to really? become the preference in many cases. Above and beyond becoming the default, do you ever see a time when it will become frowned upon to suggest a proprietary solution where companies are going to get to a point where they're going to say, are you kidding me? I don't want the vendor lock-in. I don't want the security headaches. I don't want to not know what's in the code. I want to be able to audit it. Is there a time when open source becomes above and beyond the default but becomes laughable to choose anything else? Yeah, I, I, it, in, in some cases that's already happening. I think security is a great example of that. Um, it is security professionals, the ones I work with anyway, if they can't see the code, the, the, the likelihood that they're going to trust the algorithm, you know, they're going to, um, is, is pretty low. And we've had examples in the industry of uh, proprietary security software that it doesn't get fixed fast enough, um, that vulnerabilities are, are found by the wrong people, not the right people. And, um, and without that disclosure, without that openness, it, you, you, you know, you may not know what risks you're exposed to using that kind of software. So I think security is a good example of where open source and open standards have really come to the, come to the fore. Um, within uh, a regulated industry like, like Deutsche Bank's, um, we worry about lock-in a lot. Our regulators are concerned with vendor risk, right? with being overly dependent on a specific vendor. And so even if we get commercial support for some op open source software, um, that openness gives us always a fallback. Right. And that's really powerful, which is that, you know, I could fall out with the vendor or the vendor could, could go out of business, but I've got the source code, right? So I'm still good. We can still operate. We don't have, you know, th th this... You're not locked in. Not locked in, right? You don't have this disruption to the, to the supply chain. So we do worry about that kind of risk, and that's why we're, we're really starting to position every platform in our bank at least having an open source option in the portfolio, right? So we've actually made that policy now. So you know, whether it's databases or, or, or web or, or, or Java applications or whatever the kind of category of software, we want to make sure that we have an option in the portfolio which is well engineered around an open source product. Uh, and in some cases, that open source product is, is the target, is the strategic choice. Walking around uh, Summit or actually any IT conference really for the last five, six years, all you see is containers and the push of containers and the rise of containers and different competing container technology. Mm. I'm curious, what's your opinion on how that has changed the workflows of IT? It's, it's probably one of the biggest changes I've seen 
um, in, in kind of 20 years running platforms and using open source software. Um, for a couple of angles, I, th I think the, the, this, the richness of this ecosystem, ecosystem is a lot about the, the magnifying effect of using things in combination. And products like Kubernetes and containers a, a allow, it, it just makes it so much more consumable. Right, the rough edges around some of this software, you know, there's learning curves um, in, in terms of, you, you know, take an example like Kafka, right? There's some sharp edges there. There's a learning curve in how to do that kind of stuff well. What happens, what's, what's happening now, and we've seen a lot of that at, at, at this conference, is we're seeing things like operators come along, uh, container images and standard sort of templates for, for deploying these, these kinds of workloads, allowing you to kind of smooth off some of those rough edges to engineer it once and well and then reuse the heck out of that thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and I think that's the real, the real benefit of, of this kind of you know, building ecosystem around containers, Kubernetes, and as you say, you know, other alternatives in that space. Um, it makes it consumable. It makes it really reusable at, you know, in, in the runtime. Uh, in, in a real way, and we've been talking about reuse in the IT industry for years and years, and it's, it's always been a tough thing to do. But what I'm now seeing in our, in our bank is we're, we're, we're creating templates, engineering them well, having the whole organization contribute to those templates, and therefore magnifying the benefit that, that we get. I, I think the other thing that has really changed is the speed, um, and containers in particular, in terms of how fast they are to start up, how easy they are to move around an environment, uh, and how you can use orchestrators like Kubernetes to, to create homogenous pools of, of infrastructure, it, it just allows us to do things that we could never do before in terms of standing up test environments in the blink of an eye, pipelines to do continuous integration and development, and again, for a bank, being able to release new ideas into production during the business day without massive impact to our operation, right? and without worrying too much about the risk of change, because these these technologies are now built around the idea that con continual change is normal. And so now m my experience is that everything is a pipeline and, and we are moving faster than we ever have before. When we look at other emerging technologies, one thing you're seeing is an offloading of internal services out to centralized places so that we create everything as a service. Everything as a service. And you walk around the expo hall and what you see is everything is software as, as a service. I'm wondering, have you seen any pushback from people that are looking at software as a service? And if so, what can we do to combat that pushback and what can we do to implement change within software as a service? Yeah, I, I, that's been the story of my career. Uh, I, I, jo I joined the bank to build platforms. Um, I, uh, uh, <coughs> over the years, we've built a number of, uh, of platform as a service offerings within the bank. And my customers, my customers within the bank are the, the IT development community. Um, and I've been through every phase of that journey from the very beginning where um, the, the benefits of multi-tenancy to reduce cost may not mean much to an organization that's making plenty of revenue and doesn't particularly want to share, right? And sees sharing as a risk, right? So when you talk about kind of multi-tenant platforms, then people worry about all their eggs being in one basket. You mm -hmm. worry about your kind of risk domain and, and, and um, the, the kind of blast zone of potential impact from, from, from incidents and things like that. So you do get pushback. Um, I think the ways that you combat it are numerous. Um, I think don't make platforms a black box, right? And again, one of the great things about open source applies to the way that you build and run platforms as well. Um, nobody likes a black box. It's really hard to trust something that doesn't that you, you can't you can't see inside of. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that's seeing inside of it in terms of having access to the source code, or whether it's more getting the operational data and metrics out to to feel assured that the platform is running well, and um, uh, the the kind of self service and APIs that allow you to um, interact with that platform in the way that you choose to, right? That's all about opening up. Um, so I think opening up the platform is really important. Within, within Deutsche Bank, we have a, a, a real culture around building with our customers, not for them. So I will not take requirements and go away for six months and come back with a platform. Right. That doesn't work. That never worked, really. But we now have better ways of doing that kind of development. So bringing the customers in to build the platform together, giving them ways to contribute into that platform, mm -hmm. The platforms I run within within our bank, I am the custodian of. They are not my platforms. They are the bank's platforms, and I think that that goes as well in the, you know, software as a service and in, in, in other modes of, of, of delivering platforms, which is allow your customers the feeling of contribution um, and, and commitment into that ecosystem because that will improve the result uh, for, for for both parties. 
business is very competitive and it's very mm -hmm. aggressive. How have you seen Linux sort of change the game as it relates to rapid development? It, it, it really has. Uh, and um, having been involved with it for so many years, I, 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 it's exciting for me. I love conferences like this. I love to see that this stuff is everywhere now. Mm -hmm. Everyone is talking about it. Everyone is using it. Um, and it's, it's low friction. It's got, um, uh, it's, it's consumable in a way. So in banks and, and historically using commercial software, you, you, you know, you, you tend to do, or we tended to do this kind of waterfall approach to our, to our development and, and releasing applications and getting new products to market. And you'd probably plot about three months there for commercial discussions and negotiations with a vendor around the software that you want to use, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you're going to try and size it right. You're going to try and get the right kind of um, uh, size and scale around the deployment way before you've actually started to run, you know, run the software in production and really know what you need. Mm -hmm. And you almost never size it right the first time. Um, and you lock yourself into a contract which might be inflexible. I think whether you're doing it in production or, 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 or just as part of the, the, the kind of research and development of new products, open source is just, it's consumable with less friction. Size and scale is up to you. Right? And you're not necessarily constrained by you know, how many cores you can run that software on, for example, because of a, you know, a contract that you signed a year ago. Um, it, it just gives you this enormous flexibility and access to this pace of innovation, which, it, I mean, I, I'm still trying to keep up with. Right? And I, the, the number of new names of widely deployed open source products that I've seen this week at Summit, you, you know, I can never keep up. Right. It, it's incredible, but, but that, is, that gives you access to so much productivity. Absolutely. You talked a lot about not putting your eggs in one basket, and even if we have some proprietary alternatives, we want open source to be part of that, yeah. or at least to leverage open source against maybe some of those proprietary alternatives so we have somewhere to go. How has open source changed the, the risk analysis for business? Yeah, I, I, I think um, in, in terms of risk, we, there, there, there are different types of risk that we look at, right? Um, and there are pros and cons to open source from a risk point of view. And I, and, and I think, you, you know, the, the, the one thing you always have to be careful about is your is your end-to-end -end supply chain for software. Um, and uh, one of the complexities with open source is the, the, the list of dependencies of some of the products can be very long. So I think one thing we do worry about, in, especially again in banks where we're we're handling other people's money, right? So this is, you know, really important to get this kind of stuff right, is that we do have to look at the supply chain and the dependencies that are coming with the software that we're using. And I think, you, you know, I've seen studies that say the average application that we're deploying is probably 70% someone else's code, right? O open source third party libraries all the way down. And so we, we certainly have to think about how we're analyzing the risk of, of deploying some of that software and look at tools that allow us to you know, um, investigate that supply chain, look for vulnerabilities that might be developed you know, three layers deep in the stack. Um, because we, we, we obviously don't want to get you know, caught unawares by you know, uh, a, a kind of low level library that's being used by a higher level library that we're consuming that we maybe didn't even know was there. So I think, I think it does put a little bit of an onus on us to look at that supply chain. There's some great tools out there now uh, that allow you to manage dependencies, versions, you know, look at vulnerabilities that are emerging, um, and of course tools uh, you know, like with OpenShift that allow you to very quickly then roll out you know, those new versions. So, so that's one element of risk that we look at quite, quite a lot. Um, the reversibility risk is well managed, as I said, with, um, w w with open source software because you always have the kind of the keys to the hood. If anything goes wrong with your vendor relationships, you've still got the code. Um, and, and, and that's certainly really important. Um, but I think, yeah, we, we have to balance the kind of the security, um, uh, the, the monitoring of you know, new versions and patches and things like that in the environment. And the rich ecosystem means that there is a lot of software. There's a lot of software in there, right? So you need good tools, definitely, to manage it. Tom Gilbert, he is with Deutsche Bank. Thanks so much, Tom, for taking the time to sit down with us and chat with us. And thank you very much for your work into open source and helping bring that into business at, at, at a scale that, you, that exists with something like Deutsche Bank. We appreciate your time, and thanks for coming on the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Appreciate having you. Cheers.